All right, Philippians 2 is where we'll be tonight and uh, the end of one. I had two questions that I got, comments from last week's um, blog spec principle. And so I'll try to summarize those questions and answer them for you. The first question was, how do you know when these log is out of your eye and that you can see clearly to take the spec out of someone else's eye? And the <laughs> I'll answer that question. And I'll give you the second one. Uh, I think uh, the short answer is, how do you know when you're right with God? And the answer is 1 John 1, 9. When we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, he forgives us. So we get, confession means to get on the same side of the issue as the person you've offended. So use terms that they would agree with. This was a sin against you. I sinned against you when I said this and be very specific. And so that's how the log comes out. They all, you ask for forgiveness. You also ask them as a log or sins can have multiple strands. Logs can have multiple shreds still in there. And you ask the person, is there anything else that I uh, need to confess so that I am completely right with you? I want no sin between us. And so if they say, no, you are, you have confessed. I agree with the confession and I forgive you. And if they offer forgiveness and they agree that there's nothing else between. So with us and God, we're agreeing with God's word that there is nothing between us and God. And we're cleansed, we're, we're forgiven and cleansed from all unrighteousness. So when it comes between me and another Christian, I ask, I usually ask when I've offended someone, is there anything else um, that I have done or I've said that's between us? And if they say, no, there isn't, then I say, okay the log is out then. And usually, and I said this last week too, usually it's not the time to, as soon as the log is out a few seconds later, okay, now let's work on your spec. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you usually give it some time, the more serious the log and the offense that you have committed against someone, you might need to give a little time, days or weeks. Um, I probably wouldn't go months uh, because then it's not as fresh in your mind, but uh, that's that's the short answer of how do you know when you can see clearly to help someone with their spec. The other question was, what do you do when legitimately you didn't do anything wrong and someone sinned against you? It could be abuse. It could be slander, gossip, or a number of other sins that clearly someone's done against you. And when you go to them, you don't have a log in your eye because you don't have any sin, un unprovoked. And so James 4 and and uh, Matthew 7 don't speak to that. So they speak to conflict that you have that is your sin and the other person's sin, and your sin to you is the log and their sin is the speck. So when you both have sin, that's James 4 and Matthew 7. It doesn't speak to the when someone sins against you. So if someone has something against you, you go to them, or if you have some, something against them, you go to them. Um, but when it comes to if someone sins against you, Matthew 7 doesn't, um, 3 to 5 doesn't speak to that. So there are other passages that were a pursue peace um, and love our enemies and do good to those who hate us and other things. So, um, but that Matthew 7 doesn't speak to that. So that concludes Matthew 7, and we'll go to Philippians 2 uh, tonight. And we'll be a couple weeks in Philippians 2 uh to um mine some wonderful truth out of this passage if you were to be given the the question where in the bible would you find humility of mind you probably in your top one or two passages would be this passage um philippians chapter two and we're to get some context of philippians it is written from prison about joy and Paul is uh, concerned, obviously, as his missionary journeys and his letters about advancing the gospel of Christ. So to get some context of Philippians 2, we're going to start at the end of chapter 1. He have some personal, um, personal illustrations uh, talking about the gospel and for me to live is, is Christ to die as gain. That's the middle of Philippians 1. And we get to the uh, paragraph before our let this mind be in you and uh, verse 27 of philippians 1 only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of christ so that whether i come and see you or am absent i may hear 
of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. If you were just to read that one verse, notice how many times unity is mentioned. What uh, words, phrases do you see that um, can see that Paul's going after unity here? One spirit, one mind. Okay, one spirit and one mind. Something else? Side. Right, striving side by side. So you're working side by side for the faith of the gospel, and you see, uh, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. So working together uh, with other believers, having the same spirit, mind, striving side by side, verse 28, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. So in Philippi, remember, we know the story of the Philippian jailer. If the magistrates, the leaders of that town through Paul and Silas in prison, and they established a church there with a jailer and another Lydia at the, at the bank of the river. Um, if they established a church in this town with those core group of believers and Paul and Silas leave, those believers are staying there. And if the magistrates through Paul and Silas in prison for the gospel, uh, surely the, the small church there is going to have opponents. Okay. And Paul's writing from prison, and we know why he's in prison, because he's trying to advance the gospel in a hostile, hostile places. So he is telling them not to be frightened in anything by your opponents. This is clear, a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. So we know the future of the opponents of the gospel. What's the future of the opponents of the gospel? eternal fire and destruction by holy God. So while people may, and right now there are many opponents of the gospel around the world, and we read Voice of the Martyrs and other publications and other uh, things that tell us um, with technology, we can be uh, aware of what's happening in many communist countries, uh, many um, Muslim dominated areas, Buddhist and Hindu um, persecution that's happening around the world of believers. So when, when our freedom of religion is over in our country, we will understand with much of the world what it's like to be persecuted. And much of the New Testament is written to persecuted people by a persecuted apostle, uh, apostles, um, and uh, many martyrs uh, for Christ. So we'll understand more of our, we'll live and experience more of the um, flavor of the New Testament when we have to endure persecution. Well, the, the Philippians had to endure persecution, and Paul's encouraging them not to be frightened in anything by your opponents, opponents of the gospel. Uh, it's clear that they are going to be destroyed. It's clear that you're going to be saved. Um but don't be frightened during this time. Verse 29, for it is it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Now, if Paul's writing from prison because he is uh, a believer and faithful to uh, his call to spread the gospel, um, mm -hmm. It's the same conflict, and anytime Paul writes to the Corinthians, as we saw last Sunday, you're carrying on the same ministry of Paul, who's carrying on the same ministry of Christ, it's encouraging to hear that, that we're on the same team, even though some of us are in prison and some of us are being persecuted, uh, we're all on the same team of the gospel of Christ. So to summarize verses 27 to 30 and leading us up to let this mind be in you, uh, the question we're going to ask our text is, how do we get to this spiritually wise and mature place to have a humble Christ-like mind? And these four verses would answer that question with, we stand fast for the gospel amid persecution. Uh, while persecution is coming, we can't avoid it. We're going to stand fast for the gospel. It's still going to be our commission. Uh, and we're going to carry on the same commission that Paul and the apostles and the early church and uh, church history has um, shown us. So we stand fast for the gospel. Now, chapter two, verses one through four, we may get to verse three. I think that's where, where we ended this morning. 
So he's going to use there are, uh, if you are frightened, if you are not sure you want to be on the same team as this guy who's in prison, who has a criminal background, um, then you're going to have to weigh, okay, do I really want to suffer for the gospel of Christ? And Paul starts chapter two with, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy. He uses phrases here that are so encouraging. He uses the word that we get uh, the Holy Spirit comforter in John 14 to 16, paraclete. We get that word is the word encouragement there, encouragement in Christ, someone who's coming alongside to help us and our help is in a location. And if we have embraced the gospel of Christ, we are in Christ. And if we are in Christ, we should be, <laughs> we should be really encouraged with that. Any comfort from love. What love is he talking about? Probably in the context here of Christ and the spirit, he's probably talking about the love that we get from having a relationship with God. Any comfort we get from the love of God and then any, any participation in the spirit and the spirit lives inside of us. So we are positionally in Christ. And then the Holy spirit reminds us that we are participating with Christ in, in the gospel and even if we suffer, we're suffering like Christ suffered. So all of this reminds us that we're on the right team. We're on a team where the Godhead is encouraging us and is with us and is in us. And Christ is never going to leave us or forsake us. And we can have his love and enjoy his love. So Paul is from prison, encouraging these people outside of prison with this letter to um, to be joyful and have joyful unity with the gospel. Verse two, complete my joy by being of the same mind. Now we're going to get some more unifying words here. Being of the same mind, having the same love, being of full accord and of one mind. So he, four different ways he is saying, I want you to think the same way, act the same way, have the same love and be unified with this full accord and of one mind. So working together completing Paul's joy. So if Paul's writing from prison and he hears from prison, the Philippian people, church, even though they have a lot of opponents and they're being persecuted, they are so unified. And here is what's unifying them, their walk with God. They are not giving in to persecution and they are staying faithful to the gospel and they're spreading the gospel and in persecution, the gospel is spreading. And this is super exciting for Paul, who is in prison because of the gospel. And he's saying, complete my joy. Okay, you're going to cause me to have more joy when you're staying faithful uh, to the gospel. And we will uh, be called on um, to keep standing for the gospel, uh, to stand fast for the gospel. And how do we do that? By having the same mind in Christ. A joyful suffering for Christ is possible. And this passage is going to tell us how that is even possible to have a joyful, unified um, body of Christ that is uh, faithful to the gospel of Christ. So he says, here's, here's, the, here's the secret sauce. Here is what is going to cause a tremendous unity and thinking the same mind and, and working together. Verse three, do nothing from selfish ambition. Now, where have we heard selfish ambition recently? Look at James. James chapter 3, verse 14. The wisdom of the world. If we live with the wisdom of the world, it causes us to follow selfish ambition and bitter jealousy. So selfish ambition. We, we looked at it briefly in James 3, but it's also here. So the world is ambitious, uh, which means I'm, go I'm, I'm going somewhere. I'm going somewhere in a hurry. Selfish ambition, I'm going to step on anyone, use anyone to get my way. That's how the world operates. I'll do whatever it takes to get ahead. It'll be done my way. All these are selfish ambition. And we hear this in our culture with along with following your heart listening to your heart. That's all 
fanning the flame of selfish ambition. And while James warned us not to um, be friends with the world and to identify this wisdom is not from above, it's earthly, central, demonic, and this is God's wisdom. Now it says here, how much of life are we supposed to allow selfish ambition in how we think? It says here, verse three, do nothing. Do absolutely nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. The word conceit means to lift yourself up with no base or no basis. So it's foolish to lift yourself up and have no reason. So if you imagine, I was looking out at my basketball hoop the other day, and I used to play basketball a lot in high school. And I thought, wow, people in our culture make a very lot of money if you're really good at basketball. Even bench players uh, in the NBA make a millions, millions, and millions of dollars every year. Why are they celebrated and everybody wants their autograph and they get shoe deals and all kinds of money is thrown their way because they can put a ball in a hoop. That is it. And in the world, now think about it. The world loves soccer. They call it football. What makes those people celebrities that are really, really good at soccer? They can put a ball in a net. And what good... What benefit to humankind is accomplished by these people that we are throwing millions of dollars their way every single year? You know what we get out of it? We get entertainment. And people are willing to be entertained. And that's it. And I thought, hmm, if I was a basketball player, I could just do pastoring on the side. <laughs> but you know what? <laughs> To, to get to that level, there's probably, a, not everybody that's there is, is doing it for the wrong reason. A lot of them, uh, Christians in sports, professional athletes, use their platform to share the gospel. I'm not, I'm not speaking against them, but our culture um, holds people up as celebrities because they can sing or because they can act or because they can be really good at a sport. You think, what are, what are they really doing to help our culture not much and it really comes down to it it is very little and it's actually not much for the kingdom of god at all they're building their own kingdom so that's what conceit is you're holding yourself up why are some people celebrities just because the culture says you should be celebrated and other people like paul and his culture paul was imprisoned when he should have been celebrated and the gladiators and other people who are celebrated, politicians and the people that in the Olympics and others, they were celebrated and they weren't doing anything valuable for the kingdom. And so it is today. This world is <laughs> celebrating the wrong people and holding up people. And when they're highly exalted, we look underneath and what's holding them up? What, what reason are we celebrating their life? And there's really nothing underneath. Their lives are foolish. And... We don't want to be like them. And Paul is actually encouraging us, do nothing from selfish ambition. Don't lift yourself up foolishly with no basis for uh, exaltation. And actually, we are told in James that we are to humble ourselves and accept, allow God to lift us up. So conceited people lift themselves up with nothing underneath. So do nothing for, with selfish ambition and don't lift yourself up at all but in humility count others more significant than yourself the word humility and count others is one word and it's a very long word in greek and that word humility and thinking about others other than better than yourself that word is so in our culture is like non-existent in the roman greek culture of paul's day we can't find it in greek literature it is almost like the agape love, where it's almost an exclusively biblical word that self-sacrificing love, what is that? And here is a word that is humility and count others. Like put yourself under others and think about them as better than you. That word is not in unsaved people's vocabulary. Like it, it's so foreign. And when we tell them, this is how I'm trying to think. They look at us like, what planet are you from? This is not our world. This is not the culture we live in. 
but this is a very biblical Christ-like culture that is counter-cultural. So having the same mind of Christ requires that we do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. And in humility, we are counting others more significant than yourself. Now, why would in the why on earth would we want to do that? Because we're united with Christ. We're united because of Christ. We're united for Christ. We're united with others in Christ. Everything about our life and our unity revolves around our connection to Jesus Christ. And what is the very first time that we had a relationship with Christ was built on humility. That's it. That's how our life with Christ began, with humility. And whenever we considered the cross and that we deserve to be there, oh, man. We humbled ourselves and said, Jesus is Lord. And we're saved. So Paul's going to encourage the Philippians to be unified, to stand fast, and having the same mind of Christ. And um, so here is the conclusion that with the, with the greater context of Philippians to be joyful and for us to live is Christ and to die is gain. Here's what we have to conclude based on what we've learned so far is, I will be most joyful in Christ and I'll enjoy my position in Christ mm -hmm. when I think lowly like him. We teach kids this, how to have joy. Jesus, others, you. What's the world say? Yodge. You, others, and eh, Jesus, anyway, we don't even need him. Like step over people, selfishly ambitious, follow your heart, use people all you can to promote yourself you first. Do what's best for you. You deserve it. We hear this over and over and over in songs and culture and everything about our culture is like this. You and others. And we don't even need Jesus. And this passage, like, like, like many others in the New Testament, but very clearly here is we are only unified because of Christ. And we have to do nothing with selfish ambition or conceit. Don't hold yourself up foolishly. But in humility of mind, count others more significant than yourselves. That plays out a lot in parenting. That plays out a lot in discipling someone else. This plays out a lot in talking to someone before or after church. You ever get stuck with someone who just talks about themselves? As a pastor, I get stuck on that a few times. <laughs> like, you know what? I have to remind myself. Coming to church is a, one of the highlights, is the highlight of my week. And uh, listening to people is my job. I just say, that's my job. It's my job to listen to people. And it, it becomes a joy then to listen to people and their problems <laughs> and if i if i get to talk encourage them and this is how we build relationships and unity and having the same mind so what would our relationships look like if we all did what verse three says doing nothing from selfish ambition or conceit and as soon as we do something from selfish ambition and conceit we confess it as sin because it's, a, it's opposite of what we're told to do here and then in humility, count others more significant than ourselves. The more position you have, the more power you have, the more money you have, the more education you have, the temptation is to not do this. But it doesn't matter your position in our, it doesn't matter your position at work. It doesn't matter how much you have in the bank and who, who wants your signature and who looks up to you. You can choose as, as a believer because you're free. Because you're in Christ, because you have the Holy Spirit, and uh, there's no excuse for disobeying this. Uh, so hopefully this is encouraging and uh, will help us to evaluate ourselves, and it really is the basis for joy. If you are doing things for selfish ambition and conceit, you will not be a joyful Christian. Why? Because you are counting yourself more important than other people. My time is more important than your time. My resources are more important. 
I'm more important than you. So get out of my way. Stop wasting my time. Oh, oh, oh what are we? What are we doing? <laughs> we're not living like Christ. We're not thinking like Christ, and that's where we're headed uh, next week, Lord willing.